One of the challenges that uh, I hear often when I'm in conversations with people about uh, why or why not to run for political office is the uh, hesitation around being kind of uh, in the public eye, not just for the things you entered the public space to work on. Um, so obviously there's uh, a level, a line that we all have, we all draw at a different place uh, for where my life ends as a somebody with a public presence and uh, personally, and then the public life that is you know fair game for reporting on begins if you're a counselor or a candidate or any kind of politician. So um, we wanted to have a discussion about that because I think it's uh, critical to understand what uh, expectations you can have going in about your life in public if this is something you try and succeed at. Uh, so we've asked uh, three people to come and share their experiences. Uh, and those three people are Way Mason, a Halifax City Councillor, was my councillor for uh, a while until I moved out of the district. Uh, <laughs> I guess he's not voting for Dead you. <laughs> Lisa Emery, who uh, is the councillor, uh, one of the councillors in the town of Amherst, was the deputy mayor at yes. one point, um, and Henderson Paris, who has the same biography from New Glasgow, who is a councillor and has been deputy mayor uh, of the town of New Glasgow, uh, and all of them have uh, agreed to join us today and, and share some of their experiences. So, um, quickly, the format for this is going to be, I'm going to ask them some questions, uh, and uh, I've got them prepared and I've shared with them. Uh, and uh, after I see people start to agitate and have their own questions, I'll turn it over to you probably around the halfway point. Um, we'll aim to wrap up around noon. And uh, I'll start with a question I'll put to each of you. Um, what motivated you to uh, step into public life uh, to begin with? And why do you stay involved? Um, like whoever wants to jump sure. in first. I'll, I'll just jump right in. When I, when I was first thinking about it, one of the very first questions my mother asked me was, are you just doing this as a hobby or do you really want to make a difference? And that answer was really, really easy for me. I want to make a difference. I'm not in it for the money. Perhaps you, you can't be in it for the money. You want, you want to help, you want to help your community. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to help create change and, and I firmly believe that um, w when, I, when I first ran for office in 2012, that was my whole motivation, was, was to benefit the town in some way. Now I, I should say in the past, my father was the mayor of the town for 10 years. So. I, I have a little bit of it maybe in my blood. And I did have many people ask me, are you, father, are you following your father's footsteps? And my general answer all the way has been, I might be following the same path that he was on, but I'm creating my own set of footsteps and help, hopefully helping the town of Amherst move along. So that was my motivation. And uh, yeah, I guess, um, from, from my perspective, it, it's a little similar to, to Lisa's, but um, being a, a youngest of uh, 10 children and growing up, uh, uh, in particular on, on Sunday uh, afternoons after, after church, uh, <coughs> like many households, they sit down and you have, uh, have your uh, dinner and, and there's a lot of discussions that uh, take place and of course the younger ones pretty much listen. <laughs> um, and uh, to to the others, and and the, and the topics would be from anything from from church community to to um, um, provincial news to national news. And um, my mom was uh, very much uh, uh, I don't know the uh, she wasn't a politician, but uh, and in my view, I think she was in, in many regards. But she uh, she was very indulged in. in Many uh, many issues and followed them and spoke very freely uh, and openly about them, and so I think I always said like I think I got that from her. Uh, my my interest has always been in in, in politics uh, for many many years prior to me making a step uh, to enter, but I was uh, very much uh, community community orientated and 
uh, through volunteerism and um, just doing whatever you can for your communities, I'm sure like many of you uh, here today. So, um, so then I, I really got the bug as to, you know, I really want to enter politics and, uh, and, and took that initiative and, and to, you know, I saw some things that, uh, that, you know, that I didn't really um, like that was going on in our community and I thought maybe I could help make a difference like, like, like <coughs> many people that enter um, that arena. And, uh, and, and, and so like I, I just decided, you know, okay, this is it, uh, um, 2004, like I, I set my path to, to enter politics and, and, uh, and was successful um, in, in doing that, so. That's my story. <laughs> no, that's good. For, for me, uh, I guess it starts with uh, being in a military family and service being something that had always been their grandparents and, and my father. Uh, and uh, I got to travel a lot as a kid. We got posted out. Uh, I grew up in Dartmouth, and, and we got posted out a lot. And so I got to see how a lot of different places work. But there were two moments as an adult that kind of really uh, triggered my entry into politics. The first was they tried to close my kid's school, which is something we're all familiar with, right? That's that's often a trigger for people entering politics. And uh, I was intimately involved with the politics that led up to the school board being fired by Karen Casey in Halifax in 2008. And they didn't close my kid's school. We're actually getting a new school uh, now. It's uh, so that was a lot of uh, energy, a lot of community energy spent on a project that shouldn't have had to go that way to get the right result. And uh, and then I guess the second one was the concert scandal in Halifax. So I mean, our government, in my opinion, and obviously in a lot of the voters, the electorate's opinion had become an embarrassment. You know, our mayor was in the book of mayors, the you know ten embarrassing mayors in North America book that was published. Uh, you know. Uh, the concert scandal uh, was interesting because I have a music industry background and I was teaching at the community college. It's weird for me to be here right now because I actually graduated from this campus and got my adult education diploma. So uh, it's, I'm having some serious deja vu. Uh, but um, I was the only person who knew how a concert worked in Halifax who hadn't either been contractually involved with the concert scandal or had not won the tenders to get the scandal. So I ended up doing 39 media outlets, National Post, CBC National, every single CBC Maritime Noon and all this stuff. <coughs> and I did it well enough that the CBC and at the time Open File was publishing asked me to start commenting on municipal politics uh, bi-weekly. Uh, and uh, uh, it came to a point for me, and I think it'd be interesting to hear what other people have to say about this, where people in the community who want to change were coming to you going, you're gonna run, right? You're gonna run. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, you know, a little bit of like, oh, they want me, and a little bit of, oh, do I have to? You feel like you're pulling the short straw, right? But it needed <laughs> that. You, you do, right? Because it is gonna change your life. But the, the community needed it, and I, I believe in service, and I wanted to do it. I wanted to see the city uh, and the municipality change. So uh, I ran against a 14 year incumbent and won by 94 votes. Mm -hmm. Very good. So squeaker. <laughs> so, wait, you mentioned uh, the issues that prompted you to run. Lisa and Henderson, you both kind of alluded to the issue. There were issues. What were they for you that, uh, what change were you interested in seeing uh, when you stepped into the race? First of all, they needed a woman's voice on council. <laughs> all men for many, many years. And so I, w I was elected in 2012, and I think it's been. 15 years prior to that, since they had a women on council. Wow. So. I guess for me, at the time, it was, uh, we were going to the um, smoking bylaw. And uh, so that, um, that was uh, very uh, controversial. Um, you know, at the time, uh, uh, again, being um, born and raised in a community, like your, your whole life, you, you really get to know and uh, everyone, and uh, um, and so th that was so. In, in in my case, I knew people, you know, that were that were for it and against it, of course, and and uh, and communicated those um, those vibes very strongly. Um, and it was, I guess, maybe just about the process. And uh, I can remember um, this. Um, people asked me if. Uh, if I would kind of deliver a message to council at the time um, as to, uh, you know, why they maybe shouldn't take the steps at, the, at, the, at that time. I guess uh, going through that, the general consensus was 
you know, everyone was, or a good part of people, our community felt that it should have been um, something that the province should have mandated rather than lay it in the, in the laps of municipalities. So I just wanted to, um, you know, I just wanted to, when people asked me if I would deliver a, a message to council, I saw both sides, um, you know, very clearly. Um, I, I understood the ones that smoked, I understood the ones that didn't smoke. Um, I've been into physical fitness uh, pretty much my whole life. Uh, I'm an avid runner and a marathon runner uh, formerly, um, but I still uh, 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 compete in, in, in uh, road races today. And I've coached track and field. I, I've seen the, the younger uh, generation and coached them. Um, you know, so never smoked in my life. <laughs> Family members are dead. So, like, I try to try to weigh both sides of it, but just deliver the message. Like, is this the right step you should be taking? Because business were um, were potentially seeing themselves closing, um, particularly in the uh, uh, in the entertainment business uh, with the. Uh, uh, nightclubs and lounges and that sort of thing and uh, and uh, other drinking establishments so so I kind of delivered that message and um, and uh, you know and then from then um, you know I was asked you know more so would you run for council and um, and and there's there's other issues you know like uh, at, at the time uh, that were very um, uh, relevant uh, and uh, needed uh, discussions and and needed to change uh, you know like I felt the change was in the air in many ways um, there was also a uh, an issue that deals with uh, pensions uh, pensions for municipal um, um, uh, leaders and so that was very very controversial uh, I made the sense uh, then um, when I did run that I would not accept a uh, a, a pension uh, from uh, from our municipality, I I worked for uh, for Michelin. I would, I was you know going to receive a good pension when I retired, and um, I saw that as being adequate enough for me that I didn't have to drain uh, you know any resources from the municipality on it, and and I stuck to my guns and so, sorry about that. I stuck to my guns and I didn't um, and I and I still don't receive a pension or anything like that. Actually, we don't even have one now, so. <laughs> so that's part of, part of the reasons of, that Thank I you. did that, yeah. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> Should have shut it up. I'll go on to, uh, did you just get FaceTimed? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry so about that. there. <laughs> Great, this, son. This girl in blue. <laughs> <laughs> So that actually, I mean, that uh, is a good segue uh, into the next question because this is about living life in public. So, um, yeah. what is it? Uh, are there things from your lives before politics that you miss or that you've had to, I guess, adjust to in terms of how you live your life? Not like obviously you're you're stepping into a political role, so you do a bunch of new things because of that job. But are there parts of your life that were affected? Uh, that either you didn't expect to be or were affected more than you thought? I'll go, uh, I uh, didn't expect that my wife would have to ask me, can you come to the grocery store with me this morning? And I would have to kind of assess internally because you know that you're going to have 20 people stop you and talk yes. to you about stuff. And, and, and if it's, you know, if Candy it's been a long aisle. week and it's Saturday morning, you're either saying, yeah, honey, I can totally do it. Or you're like, no, man, I'm just going to sit here on the couch. You go without me. So, so the, you know, the fact that when you're in public, you're always on. People know, they recognize who you are. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, even if they don't talk to you, uh, if you trip on a sidewalk, it might end up in Frank Magazine in, in the Halifax context, <laughs> is is weird. That has taken a lot to get used to. Uh, uh, not not just the public-facing, talking in public uh, stuff, but just the fact that people are going to come up to you and say, I know you're not working right now, but da-da-da-da-da. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, can take a toll. And uh, and it, and also my, my family. You know, my daughter's 16, right? And so you can imagine her, oh, dad, <laughs> come on, we got to get to the thing. Right. So, so it, it impacts your family too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Okay. Oh, sorry. You, go ahead. Okay. So uh, I'm sure I, I, 
my father was involved in politics. So I, I sort of knew what to expect, but we're living in a different time now. So uh, social media, everything has to be quick, 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 and trying to get people to understand that politics does not move that fast mm -hmm. has, has been you know, probably the largest challenge. Um, and yes, <laughs> the grocery store or the gas station, the liquor middle store. of the night phone the liquor call. Store. The liquor store. What well, you got in there? <laughs> or or they say, Lisa, the wine has moved over there. <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, because everybody knows that they know your face, they know your name. Um, in my case, they know my laugh because I'm very expressive. When I laugh, I laugh out loud, and I can be anywhere in a building, and somebody will come and find me because they know that my laugh. And and it's just. You have people coming up to you, and you need also need to start learning names and faces. Even if you can't remember the name, say hi. I remember you from. If you if you can't get their name, and they will introduce themselves because they'll see that little look of confusion on your face. You recognize them, but you can't quite get to it. And you have hundreds of people doing that at any given point over a year's period. So, it, it's it's getting used to that and. Somebody asked me this morning, I can't remember who, does it take you out of your comfort zone? And at times, it does. I, as a little girl, I was very shy. So you can't be shy in this job. You need to be expressive. So, so you learn to grow, uh, and, you, and you learn through the campaign pro process that not everybody loves you. Um, you need to learn how to deal with negativity because that, Negativity does come up. That's part of the part of the process. People that are upset about something uh, need to be able to. You, you need to make yourself approachable so that they can come to you and express it, even if it's aggressively, mm. and just say, "Okay, let's calm down and let's see what we can do to sort it out." So there, there's been good, and crazy, and fun, <laughs> <laughs> and some negative that you just learn how to deal with it as you go. You learn as you go. So. Mm -hmm. Anderson? Um, yes, uh, <coughs> certainly ditto to what uh, uh, Wei and uh, Lisa have, uh, have just uh, relayed to you. Um, but as well, I said, um, I really don't take calls in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, they can make them, but uh, you know, I figured if it's a, uh, and Wayne and I had a discussion just prior to, if it's a, your host is on fire, then call the fire department. Yeah. That's, not, that's not your best choice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> somebody breaking in your house, you better call the police. Like, <laughs> um, So I don't come with pepper spray. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, uh, but, but I would say really that, that, Political life is, is really, you know, it presents its challenges. Uh, there's a, there's a many uh, benefits uh, to it. I mean, beneficial to yourself as being a person and um, and given of your of your time, efforts, and talents, uh, uh, how you can help your communities. But I would say this: I would say you need to be really, really prepared almost for everything. Uh, for me, it was being, um, it was. Um, uh, trying to juggle schedules. At the time, I, got, I, was, uh, I was still working, um, and I was working uh, shift work, 12-hour shifts. Um, and so I had to do a lot of juggling <laughs> uh, with, with schedules and with committees and, and all that. And, and I did that for three years, and uh, it, was, um, it was very interesting, but it worked. I, I was able to make it work. Uh, so it's that, and it's, um, it's maybe changing your, your your um, things in life that you're really committed to. Uh, to me, uh, again, it was in, uh, in relation to, to sports and traveling with track and field nationally. Um, it, it, it didn't. It wasn't something that made me give it up. I was headed in that direction anyway because I did did that for um, close to 20 years. And so, but but I'm just saying, if if you're really um, committed to something prior to entering, you know, uh, politics that, that, you know, you could come to the point where you might be, have to give that up or cut back on something because it's very, very hard. Uh, um, a lot of, a lot of other issues take, uh, you know, to take a, a priority um, sometimes. 
So it's, uh, it's just learning to balance everything and put it all in, into perspective. Uh, know, number one, that, that you were elected uh, by, by your constituents and they expect, uh, you know, they expect service and they expect, uh, you know, you to be there uh, for them when they need them, other than maybe two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, but, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all of that. And, and you need to, you know, you need to make those things work with, uh, with, your, with your family, first and foremost. Your family has to really buy into it. You know, if, 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 if they haven't bought into it, um, then you should really not do it. <laughs> give it a lot of consideration because in, in many aspects, because there's many, I know myself and my wife, uh, uh, if she wasn't, you know, uh, supportive uh, uh, of me doing this, there's many, you know, functions and events that we go to and, and it's okay to say, well, she doesn't have to always be there or he doesn't always have to be there or whoever um, your, your, your partner is. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it does have a little drawback, you know, uh, at, at times. And, you know, I think, I think one would take away from the other eventually. And, and I know that has happened with, with uh, some people that I know. And uh, um, so you need to really think about that because you want to do it. You have to make sure that, that your, your partners and spouses uh, buy into it as well. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that too. Um, you know, in, in my relationship with my wife, we try and do everything equally and, you know, our, our like, like with sick days, right? doesn't matter what your thing is tomorrow. Uh, if I have the last sick day, it's your turn to take a sick day. We both work and we both, as she, as she loves to tell people, made the same amount of money. And, uh, and, uh, and then you get to council and it's not like that, right? It's like you ha Tuesdays are very important. You have to go to the council meeting on Tuesday in that in the city, right? And and sure, there has been one or two occasions where I have you know been late or not gone to a council meeting because my daughter had a doctor's appointment or whatever, and there's just no way to make it work. Uh, and 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 you know what? At the end of the year, what they print uh, the absences from meetings, and you're absent, right? There's no excuse. There's no I'm speaking on behalf of the mayor in Cape Breton or daughter had an appointment with IWK. It's you're a jerk. You didn't go to the meeting. What do we pay you for, right? So so the, it, it, you know it has an impact on your family, right? Uh, my my son was 17. My daughter was 13 when I was elected. And uh, and my wife has had to carry the can on a lot of stuff, so yeah. it's like it's definitely a joint decision if you're going to run. My next question is: I'd like to hear from each of you if you have one. Uh, tell us about a lesson that you had to learn in public. <laughs> Whoever wants to go, <laughs> what kind of lesson? Well, I'm thinking like you know the a private citizen has the benefit of learning on the job you know there may be a few people around bosses co-workers but uh, a lot of your work takes place in public um, you, has it ever been the case that you sort of uh, I know I work by thinking and talking a lot of things out loud I don't know if you have that benefit has it ever been the case I guess that like you you get halfway into something totally in public whether it's speaking or uh, doing some type of work that uh, and then you're like oh wait now I get it but they don't get that right but I get it and is there well I think it uh, the last sentence uh, number one you certainly need to be patient you need to be open um, because you're going to uh, you're going to feel questions and uh, responses uh, you know for and against and no matter what your personal uh, opinion is, uh, you know, at that time, um, that needs to remain in the, in, the, in the background. You need to listen to um, your constituents, uh, listen to the point of view, uh, take it, weigh it. Um, some, you, you know, sometimes there are some people that just want to speak, just want to be heard no matter what. So you just listen to them and take that for whatever it's worth, <laughs> um, but uh, but you really need to 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 listen and uh, be respectful, and even at times, and, and that that's a very hard thing. It's a very hard thing for me because I'm a person that really you know I think you know always gives respect and kind of demands respect back, um, and uh, you know and and when someone 
doesn't do that, then, you know, kind of, you know, puts me out of joint a little bit. Um, but, and, but you can also, you know, you, you are still a, a human being, you know, on top of all, all that. I will go to a point, you know, and then, you know, somebody is being really, you know, um, uh, rash, uh, you know, I, I will stop them and then correct them. Like, if you want me to listen, like, I will listen to you, you know, like, I'm not, you know, paid really to take all, you know, a whole bunch of a bull from you. <laughs> like, um, I, it doesn't matter to me if you, you know, you really don't vote for me again. Like, that, that's not my, my, my mm -hmm. issue. Um, you know, but uh, while I am there in office, like, I will make, you know, decisions based on, um, uh, correct facts and information that, that I received. So <clears throat> you need to, you know, digest those sort of things. And, um, but I think that's probably something, you know, one of the biggest areas is, is mm -hmm. you just be, just have patience and just, just listen, let them know that you're listening and, uh, you know, to thank them uh, for that and uh, say bye. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so when, when you live under a microscope, mm -hmm. you want to stay out of the heat <laughs> as yeah. much as possible, yeah, right? Exactly. And occasionally controversial <coughs> issues will come up and you'll have you know people on either side of the issue and the people that are against what you're saying they might be just so aggressive about it like they'll swear that the sun's not going to come up tomorrow morning and it's going to be all your fault right it can be just really horrible and you need to be calm and patient and explain it to the best of your ability and explain the reasons why you're tracking along this path, which is probably the best path. They just don't realize it because they're looking at their their silo as opposed to the, the vision for the entire town. And, and sometimes it takes a little while to drag them out and say, this is why, this is how it's being done. In the age of social media, when I said, you know, snap, 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 that aggression come at, can come at you very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I did warn a few people in the room, you'll see negative comments, let's say on a, a newspaper article, if you go into the Toro Daily News or the Amherst Daily News or whatever, and you'll see a negative comment, don't respond to it and don't take it personally. If you respond to it, the other 100 people that are looking at that, they will jump on you hard and fast and you will never be able to bail yourself out. <laughs> so never ever respond to us or even a Facebook post that might be negative and directed right at you. Don't respond to them and definitely don't take them to hurt. It's, it's just somebody that's blowing steam and, and they're trying to, trust me, these people, if you walked up to them and asked them what their problem was, they probably would be tongue-tied. They wouldn't be able to speak to you face-to-face. -to -face. They're doing it with some anonymity included. So, you know, just be careful about what pile you step into and <laughs> try to keep out of the negative pile. Well, let me ask Wei about that because Wei is, is, if you're not on Twitter or Facebook, one of the, I would say, one of the not most active uh, social media uh, savvy politicians on uh, social media in Nova Scotia. And <laughs> how many thousand followers do you have? Uh, Eight thousand on Twitter, so three thousand on LinkedIn, four thousand on Facebook. There, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> what's your approach to? I mean, you probably get more uh, feedback in both positive and negative directions than the average counselor with some presence there. What uh, What's your approach to dealing with the? Critiques. Comedy and disarm. I'll talk about this at some length in, in, after lunch. But you know, uh, you just you try and crack a joke. You try and you, you you do ignore, right? I mean, there's there's frequent flyers who are going to come at you over and over again on their single issue, and they can be like the sad fact of the matter is, and it's not like this with every person who disagrees with me. I'm not saying that, but the sad fact of the matter is that there's you know five or six people in the Halifax Twitter sphere who are demonstrably wrong, right? That the facts and evidence, multiple studies, you know, like common sense, everything says what you're saying, what you want to happen doesn't make any sense at all. That will not stop them, right? No. And if you argue with them, you're giving them legitimacy. Like it's just that simple, right. you know, as soon as you start arguing with them, then there's something to argue. It's that classic dodge, right? Uh, you know, and they're not really always representing 
uh, a significant portion of the population. They are a fringe, but the minute you start engaging with them, then there's two sides to the debate. You've allowed there to be two sides to the debate, and, and you're one side and they're the other, and everyone should listen to both sides with equal weight. And you know, certainly on a lot of discussions, that's the way it should be. Uh, but uh, but on the nitpicky stuff, not so much. Uh, you know, to me, you know, I have <laughs> given public speeches where I have gone off script, uh, where I'm bringing, uh, on behalf of Mayor Mike Savage and Regional Council, I bring greetings. That's how they all start. And then and then and then there's a little speech, usually written by staff. And uh, and I've gone off script and been totally wrong about what I was talking about publicly. And then the wheels uh, I, I, fall off. I and the wheels <laughs> fall off, and you got to sit there and grin and bear it through the rest of the dinner, right? Everybody around you knows you're an idiot, and you're there. You're there at dinner until the dinner's over. Yes, thank you. And uh, and the other one is when staff have the speech wrong, so you didn't even know it's wrong, and it's not your fault. And then, but you you did it, and, and you know. Uh, uh, or, or, you know, what I've learned to do is to just have a quick side chat with someone right when you first walk into a room and go, so this is this, right? Um, other, uh, you know, so those are embarrassing things. But in terms of policy, uh, you know, uh, the two biggest ones that come to mind are, uh, well, the ditch tax, right, was a great example where, in principle, everything that was going on made sense, but charging money through Halifax Water to people who'd never been charged before, instead of putting, on a, a putting it on and also the way the tax is structured. It's one, it, that was one of those things where we passed a law and started asking people to pay a tax and sending them a bill. And then as more and more information came in, you realize, so the guy who, wh why are we doing it that way? That doesn't make any sense. Like the core of it was people were paying for the water running off a road because the road ran by their house, but everybody uses the road whether they're driving off a private lane or have a foot of frontage. And we were just like, so after a year, we came back to council and two thirds of us voted to rescind it and we changed the law and we did it differently, right? Because it didn't make sense. And that's the hardest part of the, especially it's always been like this in politics, but with Twitter, with people jumping on you, mm -hmm. you know, if you get more information and it's presented to you differently and you want to change your mind, you just flip flopped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's like, that's right. ah, no, I'm like, like I now have more information and we're going to make a better decision. Right. And, and, and people don't like that. No. Like, like there's people will make hay about that till the cows come home. And, and sometimes it's, I, I'd like to think I try and always be brave about that, but I know some of my colleagues, they find that very hard and, and they don't want to do that. They, the minute you change your mind, right. you've, you've flip-flopped and you're one of those people who flip-flops. Mm -hmm. Show no fear. <laughs> yeah. And one other um, important thing I, I, you know, I think I should mention is, in, and we talk about lessons learned, is, is that I guess one other um, huge point I want to uh, point out is, is that I knew the makeup of, of councils, you know, and then, of course, in, in the Glasgow and Pictou County as a whole, and what I was getting into, uh, really didn't know, like, the, 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 the bigger picture, um, you know, to an extent, uh, you know, you know, read papers and, um, and uh, watch television and all that uh, at that time. Um, and, and you see, you know, councillors and mayors and, you know, and, uh, you know, um, in the public eye, but when I started attending uh, Union of Nova Scotia Municipalities um, um, conferences, uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities conferences, um, for you know o over the years, um, I see the lack of diversity um, out there. And and when someone mentioned about you know maybe not feeling real comfortable and, and speaking out and, and you know being you know uh, voice voices and that, that sort of thing. Uh, um, that wasn't that wasn't me. Like I wanted, you know, people to to know who I who I am, where I'm from, what 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 town or um, municipality I represent, um, and make those connections uh, to to network. I, I thought that was extremely important. Um, but um, and even more so when I looked around and didn't see many that looked like me. Uh, and so like I, I still see that as a huge gap in our province. And, uh, you know, so I'm always so glad to see uh, uh, people from diverse cultures uh, at the table and, and interested and want to be a part of it. And particularly so with, you know, with us now, with us being uh, more accepting to, to, uh, to newcomers, uh, new Canadians into our fold, um, that, that, that is a, an important part uh, and should be of, of who we are. And so I just want to emphasize that a, a little bit. Thanks, appreciate that.
I think uh, I have some other questions, but uh, I know yours are probably more relevant to you. So uh, if there are anyone who's been sitting on one that they'd like to ask our, our panel. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Just shoot from the hip. I, I, OK, I, I guess I. There I have two there. questions, but there was one that you answered about what you call frequent flyers, which yes. uh, I'm so familiar with people with mundane issues and they contact all the time. Well, the other things, of course, I'm thinking of, the other question deals with an issue that's not in the municipal sector, a provincial issue or even a federal issue. And however, people say, well, you're at the closest level of government to, to us. Mm -hmm. We need assistance or we want, we'd like you to address this issue, which is could be like education or something like that. Uh, how has that, have you come up against that issue in your years in service? And how did you handle that? Because I'm sure other ones are here that may be running will mm -hmm. face that. Well, I mean, part of it is that 20 years ago, the Municipal Reform Act changed what the different levels of government have are responsible for in Nova Scotia. So I still have people calling me going, you got to fix my house. And it's like, we haven't done Metro Regional Housing Authority hasn't been a department of the municipality for 20 years, right? But but they still, it's your job, do something, right? And well, that's provincial. I can give you Joanne Bernard's cell phone. And, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but housing is the best example and the yeah. mayor of Halifax, Mike Savagery says, uh, you know, uh, the feds have the money, the province has the responsibility and the municipalities have the problem. We have no, we have no legislative authority beyond planning matters, right? We don't build or operate. We can't, we actually don't have the legal hooks to provide the incentives that we should have to get private sector to build affordable housing that all lives in the province. And, and I, you know, in this room and on the internet, I'll say, and they don't do a very good job of it. They're doing very little right now to actually act on it. So, so that's one of those things where I try and, you know, and my colleagues who care about this are trying to push the province gently, but the few times, like at one point when we got the housing report that the province and the United Way and the city all did together through the housing, uh, uh, the, the community and housing and homelessness, uh, it said that we have 14,000 people in poor housing need in Halifax, and that 10% of Haligonians can only afford uh, $450 a month or less rent, right? So the problem is 10 times larger than I thought it was. And so I said in the committee, uh, we have a housing crisis and we need to act immediately uh, before we have a disaster. And that was perceived by members of the current government, like the political people in the, in the, in the caucus office, as me attacking the liberal government. Right. And I'm like, no, I don't care about that. I'm not a member of a party. It's yeah. municipal. But like these numbers, look at the numbers, right? And, and so, so it's a constant balance of, of, you know, we've got to be articulate on issues that directly impact our community. And if we do a really good job of that, we're potentially threatening and upsetting the feds in the province. Mm. Right. Um, does HRM pay into education, housing, and corrections? Yeah. 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 So and we're putting question. money in there too. A lot of money. Say. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that might not be fully realized by everyone, but your municipal taxes, a oh, nice size chunk of money goes towards those provincial issues, um, education, housing, and corrections. Mm -hmm. So, and I agree with everything that he said. <coughs> housing is probably housing and poverty. You know, they kind of go hand in hand, and, and so those are probably the biggest issues that you'll that will come up in front of you. Um, and literally, we don't have a say. We pay into it, but we don't have a say. We're no, we're no better than the citizen in that regard. But if the citizen wants help, trying to get through the maze trying to find who they need to speak with um, you can help with that part if they want if they want you in the room I mean I have sat in the room before but we really have no no say you know in those particular subjects and, and that is quite true like and and, uh, and it gets frustrating because you know people you know want want help right and uh, and I think from day one when I, when I got elected, it was, you know, d to deal with housing, um, and uh, and you know that was the issue, and and then to find out, you know, hey, you're very little say. We pay, as you said, um, you know, huge amount, amounts of money into the province or, uh, for for uh, housing, and uh, and and we just 
don't have any say, even though we have a representative from our municipalities sitting at the table, um, it's still, they still don't address those issues. And so it becomes very really hard. And then the other point to that, which comes also frustrating to, to, to us as counselors and, and to our communities and to our residents, is that even though housing, you know, is there that what, what they do have and people are in it, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, unfortunately, uh, dealing with unsightly property, properties yeah. and which um, probably eight times out of ten to deal with um, uh, provincial housing. And, uh, and so, you know, like always after them to, to, to have their residents maintain, you know, areas and to keep their grounds, you know, um, free of debris and all that sort of thing. And, and, and that shouldn't be, uh, you know, we, we spend a huge amount of resources uh, trying, to, trying to fix that uh, situation. Uh, and so, you know, and so when it comes to, um, you know, comes to, tab to the table, council table, about your land and being um, made possible, it, you know, sometimes there's always that, well, wait now, what's it for? And, um, you know, even though we know the need is there for housing, like, um, you know, there's that little barrier sometimes because of, of, of past uh, um, trends, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, but, but ultimately, you know, housing and, uh, is a huge problem and, and uh, poverty and and uh, homelessness, uh, for sure, in every area. Yeah. Um, so I know we have, uh, I see a few hands up. Uh, I'm gonna say this will be the, the last question, but also um, remind folks that uh, Wei and Lisa are both here with us uh, for lunch and for afternoon sessions. I'm not sure if Henderson is able to join us for lunch, but... Um, uh, yes, I, I think I'm going to be here for lunch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll save for lunch. Uh, yes, I, think. <laughs> I think my wife has gone shopping. So, <laughs> um, so we'll take one more question and then I would encourage you to, to have chats with them at lunchtime and, uh, and continue the conversations of which uh, there are too many to fit into the short time we have together. So over here. Uh, I try and volunteer and be involved with a bunch of different groups and one of the challenges that we run into with municipal councillors a lot of the time is that, and I understand that you get your power from the Municipal Government Act, but we still see a lot of councillors just kind of have this attitude of not my jurisdiction, not my problem, go talk to somebody at the province type thing. And I just, I want to see more councillors, like that kind of attitude makes at least me think I want to replace my counselor, right? Not necessarily what myself, but the counselor needs to be replaced. But I, I liked what you had to say about trying to work on housing and doing what you can within what you're given to deal with that issue. But how, how do you kind of strike that balance and try and work with the people and that are trying to I know what you're saying, but the first thing you got to understand, like, like of, of the three of us is I'm paid, it's a full-time job, right? I quit my job at NSCC and I'm doing this full-time. And I have just the municipal stuff, 140% work of the 100% time that I have available. There's more stuff just for the municipal, right? So I'm approached all the time about other stuff outside of like my immediate where I'm actually making motions and driving policy and harassing staff and doing research and going to meetings, right? And and so a lot of the time, I think that counselors are responding to in self-defense because simply like, yeah, there's a whole world of federal and provincial stuff that I could have an issue with, but I just don't have time because I'm gonna be robbing from the municipal stuff to talk about non-municipal stuff. So when someone calls me about boycotting a country or whatever, whatever, <laughs> like I, I get it and like, you know, uh, you know, in my past life, I have done a lot of that stuff myself. But but for me, I, you know, like, if I'm not focused on like the transit plan, and getting the feds in the province to fund it, or focused on wastewater, $2.6 billion tab coming due, feds and province to pay for that, like, that's where I have to put 99.9% .9 of my time, right? And unless it's an acute issue in front of me, like housing, right, which I think should be municipal, I don't think the province should do it, they should just give me the money and we'll do it. But, and I understand that from your perspective. I guess I'm just looking at things from a more rural perspective. I was right in Shubenacti and East Hans, and yeah. like, the example that immediately comes to mind for me is the fracking issue. 
Okay. So let's hear from uh, our two rural counselors, and then uh, and then we'll have to wrap up to get to, to lunch on time. Is the, the the issue of not my job? Um, I, I don't think that... I would or ever have said that to anybody. Yeah. Um, if it was a housing issue, like I said, I, I would at least attempt you to put you in the room with the right person. You, and if I have to be there with you, I'll be there with you. Um, we don't get paid as a full-time uh, person, uh, and but I should tell you, like I'm on seven council committees that take a whole lot of focus, and that means a lot of meetings. And I'm in uh, like four or five different community groups that I I'm also belong to. And anytime I can sort of cross-reference and say, hey, why don't we put all these people in a room together? That's always a good day, but some days it's just one meeting after another, trying to figure out who needs what, and trying to figure out who I need to go to to get to get whatever it is that you need, and it could be an MP or an MLA, or it could be it could be a community group. You need help from, uh, let's say, Family and Children's Services, which is now Child Welfare. It could be something like that, or Autumn House, which is uh, the women's shelter. You know, if if it's a housing problem, but the issue is poverty and they need to help you, those might be the resources even better than an upper level of government. So you, you just need to know where all of the strands are and try and piece them all together. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I certainly understand ways, you know, po point on that because, you know, he is a full-time, you know, a counselor paid for that. And, and, and living in a city, you know, there's so much more. To me, it depends on your region, your area, you know, like, I think we have Littleport, uh, Salcom, Pictou County, Nebraska, Pictou County. We have, you know, a uh, little bit more flexibility um, as far as um, number one, we remember we saying, have the patience and listen and see how we can help. It doesn't matter to me if you're, you know, someone lives in their royal, you know, municipality or, or the town. If I can, someone approaches me or calls me, if I can help, I'll try to help. Um, with that uh, being said, for instance, uh, and we certainly don't have time for this, but we are currently going through a process of amalgamation, a voluntary amalgamation um, uh, application we have before the EUARB board, um, trying to amalgamate uh, four municipalities in our county. There's six, but we're only four is at the table. Um, and hopefully the other two will come down the road. Uh, but um, to, to hopefully just address issues such as that, First and foremost, we're looking at, you know, hopefully you will, we might be able to track uh, more uh, funding opportunities and, and so we'll therefore attract more businesses, but also to, to cut red tape if we can, you know, to help, you know, one another. And so, uh, so you know, but, but they do exist. Those are Jews and people do say them, but me, myself personally, I've always been one to try, it's whoever calls me or, or uh, if I can help them, I will try to do, same as Lisa said, point them in the right direction at least, but not brush them off, because that's, that's not what we should be doing. Thank you. The lunch is, I believe, over there. Before we break for that, uh, I'd like to round out with one quick question, and uh, in the interest of time, I'll ask that panelists answer in no more than the number of words they can fit in an out breath. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be difficult. Um, so the question is, uh, it sounds to me like your jobs are somewhat stressful at times. What is your escape hatch from politics? Uh, make sure you have family time and uh, reading and video games. You said reading? Reading and yeah. video games and Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> My, mine is music. That's how I escape. And even listening. if I have to get in the car and drive around the block, and sometimes it's hard rock and roll just to blast out whatever, <laughs> whatever negativity might be in there. And the other times it's classical, just kind of slow it down a little bit, Lisa. You're going way too hard too fast. So. Great. I certainly can't stress enough the importance of family. Uh, I think they're there to, to help you always through the highs and the lows. and. Uh, um, and so that is releasing itself to spend the time with them and particularly, you know, myself now, you know, with, with uh, my grandchildren um, and, uh, you know, spending time with them. 
Um, but of course, my 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 love and my passion is uh, is running, and uh, and that keeps me halfway sane and <laughs> gives me my release. So exercise, family time, music, and video games is what I got. From that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank works. you to all of our panelists, and uh, thank you. And we have lunch over here, and we'll be back. And we're a little behind schedule, but we'd like to stick to it. So we'll be back right around one uh, with the ground gain sessions the after this afternoon. Thanks. Awesome. Uh,